A lot of you guys in the comments have been asking about cameras and the astrophotography cameras that I use. So I'm going to share a little bit about what I know, show you some of my cameras and help you decide which camera is best to choose for your particular type of astrophotography. I'm Dylan O'Donnell and you're watching Star Stuff. Should mention that I'm not sponsored by any particular camera company. I would welcome sponsorship though. Eh? Different cameras are good for different things. The sort of camera you want for shooting lunar, or solar or planets is going to be different from the kind of camera you need for capturing deep space. We can divide cameras up into basically three different categories. Film. <laughs> and digital. And in the digital category there's CCD and CMOS. This is a CCD camera, a QHY12, and this is a CMOS camera, a ZWO174MM. Uh, you can get CMOS cameras in different sizes as well. Here's the little ZWO290MM. CMOS you're probably familiar with as the camera that you have in your pocket. It's on your smartphone, it's on most handheld compact cameras, and DSLR cameras. Uh, how am I going to show you my DSLR camera? Hang on. DSLR camera. I use a Canon 6D Mach 2, which is actually pretty good and has pretty good low light sensitivity. That's my Milky Way rig. Anyway, that's a CMOS style of sensor as well. And what's the difference between a CMOS camera and a CCD camera? Well, CCDs are more expensive. They're more expensive to make and so they're more expensive to buy. On the other hand, they've been around a lot longer. The technology is more mature. Essentially, what it comes down to for you and me as the astro imager is how good these cameras are at capturing light. Now, a CCD pixel is much better than a CMOS pixel at capturing photons. Uh, it has a very high quantum efficiency. The pixel sensors pick up almost all of the light that's hit, whereas a CMOS sensor has lower efficiency. That said, the technology is getting better every day. CCD stands for Charge Coupled Device, whereas CMOS stands for Complementary Metal Oxide Semiconductor. Now CCDs have held the mantle as the gold standard for deep space astroimaging. They're perfect for things like galaxies and nebulas. They're not so good with bright objects. They're not high speed, they're very low readout. So you take a frame and it takes a while to read that off the, the camera. So the two CCD cameras I'm using are the QHY12 and I'm also using the QHY9. The QHY9 is the Kodak 8300 chip. Now, Whenever you're looking at cameras, look at what the actual chip is because it's different from the brand of camera that you're getting. Uh, the QHY12 is using a Sony chip, the QHY9 is using a Kodak chip, and the Kodak 8300 is a really, really popular chip. Um, you'll see it popping up everywhere, and it's been a mainstay for astrophotographers for a long time. If you're in doubt and you are springing for a, a CCD style camera, definitely check out any kind of camera which has this Kodak 8300 sensor, it's really good. Uh, another difference between CMOS and CCD is that CMOS cameras are great for planetary. This is the ZWO174MM and it's super high frame rate. Uh, it has cooling, so it has this big cooling system on it if you want to plug it in and get uh, cooled images of deep space. Now for a long time the difference between a CCD camera and a CMOS camera was the cooling. CCD cameras have a um, Peltier style cooling system but now there's a huge range on the market of CMOS cameras which have the, all the benefits of the high speed that you get from CMOS but also have the cooling so it's pulling down the noise traditionally associated with CMOS sensors. CCD sensors have always been considered very low noise you can cool these down to you know minus 15, minus 20, minus 25 degree temperatures and uh, your images end up really really high quality because the noise is pulled out of them you still have to stack to get rid of that random noise, but the data is really clean to start with, which really helps. CMOS cameras, on the other hand, the frame rate is something that you really need for planetary. So planetary, lunar, solar, you want a CMOS style camera. For a long time, people were repurposing webcams. We don't need to do that anymore because these products, like ZWO ASI range, are really geared up for that sort of high-speed 
astrophotography. To reiterate, one main problem is the noise profile between these two types of cameras. CMOS has a higher noise profile even with cooling, uh, the CCD has a lower one. Basically at the end of the day means you can stack more images from the CMOS camera to get a comparative result from the CCD. I like the CCD a bit better and there are some more reasons for that. You'll notice that with the new CMOS cameras, especially the ones with cooling coming out now, uh, even though they have cooling and even though they have quite high resolutions like the traditional CCDs, they also come typically as a 12-bit camera instead of a 16-bit camera. Now what that means for us is that with a 16-bit camera, there's a greater range of values between black and white than there is with, uh, with the CMOS camera. You get a higher dynamic range with CCD. After stretching is done and you've pulled the image together, you don't need as much of that high dynamic range. But you can pull out a lot more detail and a lot more subtlety in your nebulas and things like that with 16-bit raw data. Uh, that's not to say that the new cameras that do deep space but are CMOS based aren't very good. You can still do a lot and the difference is going to be negligible for most people. Uh, again, more data is better. So the more you can stack, the more you, the data you pull out overall. But you have to do less stretching with the CMOS data than you do with the CCD data. Now a CCD camera like the QHY9 is going to pull a bit more power than you would pull from a smaller CMOS high-speed camera. Um, that's generally not a problem these days. We're usually in an observatory or we have very good power products like the Celestron power tank. Uh, so we don't have to lug around big portable batteries anymore or we have inverter systems uh, or we have access to power wherever we're imaging from. So it's not so much of a big deal, but the CCDs will use more power than the high-speed CMOS cameras. Now there are so many brands out there um, some that spring to mind are obviously the QHY and the ZWO, but also SBIG and ADIC. Now SBIG are traditionally known for doing more scientific grade cameras. Their cameras are more expensive, but they're also huge. Um, you get more features out of them, uh, but you want to make sure that your telescope payload, your mount payload can handle that sort of thing. And if you're doing F2 imaging like I'm doing, where you've got the camera at the, at the top of the scope, you just can't use an SBIG, they're just too big, they block all the light. But if it's hanging at the back of the scope, it's actually a really good camera. If you could afford one, great, SBIG CCDs are the way to go. Uh, now you've also got the Addicts. I don't have a lot of experience with Addicts, but um, for what I know from my friends that use them, they have great driver support, they have great support overall, great build quality, they're excellent cameras. They pack a low profile as well, so even if you're doing F2 imaging or you just want a lighter camera, they're good for that too. QHY, uh, I get good results out of but they aren't known for their driver quality. There are some bugs in the drivers, uh, I've had issues over time, the support's not very responsive, but alternatively, they're very, very cheap. So a QHY camera is good if you just want to get the chip that you want, in my case the Kodak 8300, but you want a low price and you're not paying for a big brand name or anything like that. QHYs are made cheaply out of Asia and they're good cameras. Um, the ones that I use, uh, particularly the QHY12, have a very low profile so that at the front of the camera they don't block a lot of light if you're doing that sort of thing. Uh, but generally, you know, this is beer can shaped, it's very very small profile, which is good. But again, not great driver support. And finally there's the ZWOs. Now the ZWOs are pretty much the one of the most popular cameras on the block at the moment. I expect that they will continue their releases. Uh, with new experimental cameras and great specification CMOS cameras coming out. Keep your eye on what they're doing and they're releasing cameras so fast now you really want to get onto either buying a second hand of last year's release or just buy one of the new ones. The rate of technology is increasing really quickly um, and all the cameras that, are, that they're putting out now are really quite good. Just make sure that they fit the profile for your particular setup. The chip sizes and the features between the ASI 290mm and the 174mm are quite different. Their uh, chip sizes are very different, so you'll get great results out of the 290mm for planetary, for doing really small planets. The 174mm will allow you to do that too, but it has slightly bigger pixels. So it does allow you to do bigger things, like maybe a full portrait of the sun or the moon, or a big chunk of it to do a mosaic. Whereas this is really more geared up for just very small planets. When I say fit the profile for your particular setup, you have to test the camera's resolution, its pixel size, against the magnification power of your particular telescope. So I highly recommend whatever you're looking at,
go to the Bintel astrophotography calculator that I helped develop and plug in the details for your camera and your telescope and look at the oversampling in particular. You never want it to be undersampled. You can be a little bit oversampled, that's not so bad, but good sampling somewhere in the middle will mean that you get the best results. It's really disappointing if you buy a camera and it might have the best specs ever, but because it doesn't match your telescope's magnification power, it's not gonna work very well. This little ZWO camera, for example, it has great small pixels, but small pixels are better for a big telescope. The small pixels are really wasted on my nine and a quarter inch uh, Celestron Edge HD because I'm oversampling. So I get a lot of data in the image, but I'm not getting more detail between the pixels. Now, most cameras are going to have a two inch thread, which is this two inch space over the chip. Uh, but they will come with a little adapter normally for the one and a quarter. So you can slip that into your one and a quarter. And every time you buy a camera, you'll end up with more little black things. File those black things away. I have a lot of those. In fact, I have an entire shelf just dedicated to little black things. It's a really good resource to draw on when you're looking for that, that match between a certain adapter or a certain camera and a certain telescope setup. Now you probably also want to decide between a color camera and a black and white camera. You will get more detail using a mono camera. Um, however, you will need to use a filter system. This is the sort of thing that you'll need with your filters in there. It's got a little wheel, but you can get motorized versions of these as well. So if you're shooting with a mono camera, it's three times the work to get the red channel, the blue channel, the green channel, but the detail you get at the end of the day is far better than a color camera. I'll probably need to do another video entirely on this concept about mono versus RGB camera quality. But if you can afford it, Go for the mono and the filter wheel setup. It's far better. I know it's more work, but trust me, it's far better. Now, I haven't spoken much about the camera that I'm filming on, the Canon 6D Mach 2. I've spoken already about the fact that a CCD camera is better for the deep space stuff and a high-speed CMOS camera is better for planetary, solar, lunar, more solar system stuff. Now, where DSLRs fit into this is sort of middle of the road. They're a good all-rounder camera. You can use them for planetary and solar, but they aren't gonna be as good as a high-speed CMOS. And you can use them for deep space, but they aren't gonna be as good as a proper CCD camera. They have a filter, an IR filter. This is an infrared filter that blocks the infrared light, which is great for day-to-day -day shooting. The color balance looks normal, but when we're shooting things in deep space, there's that bit of the spectrum at the end of the rainbow, over the red, that we can't see, but the cameras can see. A DSLR camera is gonna have a filter that blocks that out. Some people modify their cameras to get rid of that filter. And you can actually buy cameras from Canon and Nikon that are geared up for astrophotography and don't have that filter in the first place, which is great. And you'll get a lot more sensitivity when you're shooting the Milky Way, when you're shooting nebulous regions of the Milky Way. You get Barnard's loop, you get all of that red hydrogen detail showing up really nicely. Smartphone cameras and DSLR cameras, they filter out the infrared signal. But astrophotography cameras generally don't because we want all of that light. So take this little infrared remote, for example. When I hit this button, this little infrared LED will light up. You can easily see the IR here using my webcam on my computer. But if I try the same thing on my smartphone, nothing. But a DSLR camera is a good all-rounder. You can still use that camera for day-to-day -day stuff, like taking photos of your kids, but you can also use it for Milky Way, gorgeous, epic nighttime shots, and you can also hook it up to your telescope using an adapter and use it for deep space, you can use it for planetary. It's great for moon portraits. It's great for um, space station transits. It's great for solar, lunar, but not so great for the small planets and not as good as the CCDs for deep space but they are a great middle ground. If you could only choose one sort of camera, I'd probably recommend the DSLR because it's a good all-rounder for everything. And one last thing I'm gonna rant about is Canon versus Nikon. It's the age-old debate, it's like Fender versus Gibson. I'm gonna plant my flag firmly in the Canon camp. And I don't say this lightly, I've used Nikon before. In fact, I switched everything over to Nikon at one point and bought Nikon lenses, bought a Nikon body, did the whole thing. 
And as soon as I got into astrophotography, I realized that Canon was slightly better. Now, not in terms of optical quality or anything like that, and both Canon and Nikon have a dedicated astrophotography camera now that has the infrared filter removed. Um, so that's not the issue. For me, it was the driver support. Canon has a far better menu system. Uh, it was easier to use in the dark for when I was out in the dark. And the fact that they opened up their firmware for developers to be able to interface their software made it much easier for software to proliferate. So there's a, there's a whole plethora of astrophotography software out there for Canon that isn't there for Nikon. And that's about it for my rant on astrophotography cameras. I hope that helped clear up a few things for you. You got to see a hands-on look of some of the cameras. Hopefully it helped guide your decision. Please leave me a comment, subscribe if you want to. And uh, if you've got any questions, just let me know. And with that, bye-bye.